Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is John, full-time eBay reseller based in Melbourne, Australia. Hi, I'm Chris and also a full-time reseller here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, you knew that we were going to meet up to exchange things from the conference that we went to a month ago. And when we were there, we had a three-way conversation with Jason from eBay All Years Chat. And you guys found that really helpful, said that we should do this conversation type yes. thing again. So here we are. We asked for questions, you delivered. They're in this bowl. Thank you. And so we will start answering them. And the first one being, what do you look for when sourcing and how do you go about comping those items on the go and when you list them? Cheapest. Yep. Ah, that's basically, a, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Basically, the, the whole spiel of how do I resell items? <laughs> <laughs> um, Am I asking you this or are we answer, both answering it? Whichever, whoever feels... Okay. Well, you can answer first and then... Well, I I don't go sourcing and comping anymore. So I, you guys know, I sell by by range. So essentially, the moment I know something is of value, I work out the range of items within that thing. So Transformers, for example, if I start selling one Transformer, I yeah. start understanding all the Transformers and all the different movies and the variations. That way, when I... So I suppose in that sense... It's a visual research. So for me, so some people, for example, they will know items by name. Um, they're very words based. Some people are very, you know, if I see it, then I'll, if I see yeah. it, then I'll know it kind of thing. For me, it's a, it's a visual catalog. So um, I'm the kind of person who, are, when I was into Pokemon back in the day, I'd have all the pictures and I know the names by the pictures, but not really. Yeah. Without the pictures. Yeah. yeah. So pictures mean everything to me. So, for me, I would pump in a word into Google Transformers, and at the moment, if I knew that there were movies, I type in the movies and I just scroll Google Images. Yeah. And then somehow my brain picks up the images and the names under them, and then once I'm out looking for things, I'm on Facebook Marketplace. For me, with toys, it's bulk lots of marketplace. Yeah. Very quickly, my brain goes ratchet, um, you know, skids. You know, it just happens, and somehow chronologically it starts to sort out as well you know by the movie like the first yeah. movie versus the second the third age of extinction last night yeah. you get the idea so that's how i research items and then pricing wise my brain retains the hierarchy of pricing so for example i will know that one figure will always be more expensive than another figure but as yeah. to what the number is that's just as oh. you as you pick it up you price it for that period because yeah. it's it's like fish market isn't it it's whatever whatever fish is worth on the day. You know, you can't just... You, like, you'll know that tuna is always more expensive than this. Yeah. But you don't know exactly what the price tuna until you catch it and price it on the yeah. day. So it's kind of like that with me. Yours. Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess the way I'll answer this is traditionally I'm, I'm an everything seller. Now I'm niching into more different categories that makes more sense. But if I was to answer this question from an everything seller, like, what do I look for when sourcing? It's like, well, if I don't... I don't have any particular expertise in one particular area. I naturally started to get into books mainly because when I was looking through shops, they're the things that kind of stuck out to me, right? Like, and that's, you know, I didn't really say, okay, I'm going to start reselling and I'm going to start doing books. It was kind of like, how can I go into this shop and find something to sell and make me money, right? So now when I'm looking for things other than like, if I'm buying wholesale, which is one way that I'm sourcing now, but if I'm out thrifting, purely thrifting, um, it's now going in there with the intention of, okay, what's the educational informational knowledge that I have? And I apply that into the store first, meaning looking for what I know. And then it's a matter of looking for things that wink at me. And when I say wink at me, like, um, you know, it's, it sticks out, right? Like it's, it's like, oh, that looks interesting. Or maybe if I'm looking in the book section, it's like, there's a set of books and you're like, oh, well they stand out because it's a set of them. So I'm looking for a trilogy or a set because naturally it's like, well, the more together that's probably going to sell more worth more as a collection as a lot um i might look for certain styles so i like a lot of fantasy and sci-fi stuff personally so i tend to be drawn to that um this is books once again but you know i was just chatting to john about um i found a porsche gold leafed um mug i wasn't looking for it i was just you know oh yeah well, there's the mugs i walk past and it's like oh it's porsche everyone knows porsche logo yeah. and it's like oh, that's cool and it's got a gold trim it's like i looked it up on the internet so comping um, looked it up on eBay and looked at sold. If you don't know how to do that, I, I do have a video of how to look up sold comps. Link it. Um, and looked it up and I could see that, you know, they were going anywhere between 30 and $55. I was like, 
sweet, I'll take that for two bucks. So, you know, it's a bit of a luck of the draw, but I think that's the way I go about it. Um, if I'm now buying wholesale, completely different conversation, probably a bit more like you because you know where your price buckets are or what you want to price things at. So I'm doing a lot of clothing. So I know I'll have shirts that I can sell at $40 every day, but then there's going to be the more iconic ones or special ones, which maybe it's because of the fabric or they've got a big logo on it or like it's really, really old. So I might be able to put that at $90, but I have to do the research on that. Sometimes uh, it is better to just, if I know I can get $40 for today, but it's worth $90, it might just be worth selling it for the $40 because I don't want to wait around or spend the time researching of what it actually should be. But if you can acquire the knowledge, yeah, you might be able to make an extra 30, 40, 50 dollars by having that understanding. Yeah. And also, we cannot stress this enough, not everybody on eBay knows what they're doing. And <laughs> yeah. not buyers and sellers. And whenever you see a historical data point, you don't know how long that data point took to eventuate. What it means is Items for sale, yes, it sold for $90, but they did sit for three years. You don't know that. And so because of that, you still need to yeah. sell and sometimes take the 40 and see how fast it turns over at the 40, increase the 50, yeah. see how long that takes to turn over. That way, when somebody comes in and sees that rubbish data point yeah. and puts it at 90, you'll be like, nah, this is that, that person obviously followed yeah. an idiot. I'm going to keep pricing at 60 because I'm happy to hold it for two weeks. And, and now the way I look at it, because if once, and I, I say this without, you know, trying to make it sound easy, but there comes a point where if you've got enough stock and you can get that stock, you know, effortlessly, you don't have to worry about getting top dollar because it's more about the volume. So I can just say, okay, I'm just going to sell this at $40, right? Whether it's red, blue, black, or green, it's like $40 flat rate kind of thing. And you just move it because I don't have to worry about looking for, I need to get 60 from that one. Oh, I can only get 30 for that one. Now there will come a time where I have to also say, well, that's only worth $20, so I can't sell that for 40 But if you build your price buckets, it doesn't matter about trying to get top dollar. It's about getting the best dollar as quick as possible in the shortest amount of time kind of thing, right? Um, again, I've had people, DVDs, like I had them listed at $9, dropped them to $7, and all of a sudden 30% volume increase just because of a couple of bucks. So yep. yeah, price, money talks, right? <laughs> yeah. Another low-key strategy, by the way, on comping and research is the fact that if you, are, if you are able to get something really, really cheap, somehow you have access to this item really, really cheap, and you decide you want to tank the market and bring it down to $40 forever, and you become the predominant data point, you make money, nobody else knows how to source it that well, essentially for the whole market to yourself. So yeah, well, that's true. consider that as well. And you it's, don't do that, do you? Nope, I do not. <laughs> How do you plan your sourcing nowadays? Slightly different question. Do you actually plan to source? Um, well, yes and no. So it's funny because we were just talking about this. <laughs> so if anyone watches my content, CL Furlong, that's my channel. On Wednesdays, I drop a sourcing video. It's called Sourcing Photo. And now tradi traditionally, that's always been me going out thrifting or sourcing items to sell on eBay. Um, but in the last probably four or five months, I have not been relying on that for my sourcing needs to be able to list to sell. It's now become more of a thing that I just like to do or keep it consistent with the with YouTube. But it's a way for me to learn, try new things, have some fun and see if I can find some gravy. So, I mean, I guess, how do you plan your sourcing nowadays? So I now plan in advance of like, because I'm buying a lot of wholesale or buying bulk deals or working with people that I know that has stock for me and I can go back to them. I'm planning ahead of like, okay, how much runway do I have? Do I need to go out and actually source from a thrift shop, like to get some extra goodies or whatever? Or do I have enough? Now, usually when I have enough, I still go thrifting once a week anyway. One, we'll, we'll call it for mental health reasons, you know, just to get out of the office. But therapy, it's yeah, therapy. Right, and you know, it, I'm addicted. Um, <laughs> no, but it is, it's a chance to go out and learn and also take some of the research or knowledge that I've done from bigger lots and apply that and... As I've progressed, if you go watch in the last six, 12 weeks, you'll see I'm picking up items that I wasn't picking up prior to that six, 12 weeks, like yep. more clothing and different things, or I can be a bit more nitpicky and like, okay, I'm not picking up those DVDs anymore. I'm now picking up that because I'll pay $20 for it because I know I'll get 80 for it, yep. right? I'm not paying a dollar for a DVD if it's only going to get me 10 or 20 because it's just like, just can't be bothered mm. or it's, it's not worth it. I may as just go list a shirt, right? Um, yeah, so that's that's probably how I go about it now. 
I don't plan my sourcing and I think that's actually a bad thing because with Facebook Marketplace, you cannot tell when somebody is going to put an item up for sale. That's true. And so my biggest challenge actually during the day from a procrastination point of view <laughs> is that I'm on Facebook and I'm sourcing. Yeah. Um, I've set alerts to tell me when items are listed new, but even then often I've noticed Facebook's notification function is a bit late. It's like delayed, like, right? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. once it happens, you, you, the items have been up for like 10 months, yeah. it's 10 minutes or so. But then again, it's the thing, it's the, the whole formal thing is like, if I don't, if I, it's this belief, like if I checked earlier, I would have gotten it. Well, not really. So I suppose that kind of keeps me on yeah. my toes. And in that sense, I've come to slowly recognize that there needs to be designated sourcing times, but miss out a lot, I miss out a lot, yeah. whatever. Um, and for the most part, I buy often and big. So I check, I essentially check Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree, I reckon once an hour. Um, but that's usually things like, um, it's very strict search wow. criteria and it's, um, I'm taking photos of a couple of tubs, put the tubs in the wall, quite frankly, my, my, my speed slowing down anyways, take out the phone, that's my like five minute just check. So I suppose yeah. in that sense, if I'm working 10 hours a day, I'm sourcing for 50 minutes a day. Um, that's kind of how I plan my sourcing yeah. because yeah, otherwise I, I can be there on for, for, you know, an hour, and then sometimes I might change the marker, go to a different state. Yeah. It's like, it's not a productive use of time. So planning definitely is hmm. better than not planning. Yeah. Um, I'd love to have my own supplier of stuff, yeah. but that's not but, my But I think business. that's, that's so, another point, right? Is like, so I, yes, I've got to I get stuff wholesale, but the other thing is now building relationships with people, which they're not necessarily picking for you, but when they've got items they'll tell you or building relationships where they're keeping an eye out for you. And this could be at op shops. This could be just people in your family. It could be um, other businesses and things like that, because if they don't it, think about it. If like, if you need a cardboard for packaging or something, if you walked into your local grocery shop and say, Hey, anytime you have extra cardboard, can I have it? They're probably going to say yes. Right. I mean, mm. like, so it, it's simple conversations like that. Now that's not for sourcing, but um, the same thing applies. So if you've got other people looking for you, it's happening in advance. So it's kind of like they might say, okay, when I've got 50 items for you, I'll give you a buzz, right? So you don't have to do any work, but it's planning ahead knowing that, well, every so often I'm going to have, you know, someone with 50 of those items to come give it to me. I do the same for other people. Whereas when I get a bunch of stuff, I don't want to sell them, but I'll sell them to half price of what they can double their, or triple their money with. And I make a quick buck and they make a quick buck. They've got their goodies and everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. And that's still sourcing in a sense for me because well, we've got the items still making money and yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Next question. What's a tiny one? Yeah. Tiny one. It'll be like a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> How do you tell if DVDs are fake? I've got no idea. I don't sell DVDs. So look, and also I come from Malaysia where DVDs get pirated regularly. So to me, I don't care. They're, but, they're all fake. Yeah, they're all fake. I don't care. Um, but obviously Chris knows better than I do. So. Yeah. So look, to be honest, <laughs> I, I don't find many fake DVDs. Um, there's probably a couple of tells. And there'll be plenty of people in the comments that I'm sure will have their opinion about this. Um, just to be frank, probably 20% of my store, 30% of my store is DVDs. Um, so the first tell is usually the cover, like the printout. Like that's that's my first tell. So if you pick up a... It's like if you picked up packaging or something for anything. Well, it's the off-centered thing, isn't it? It's off-centered. It just looks like you've literally printed it out in your local like a uh, desk printer. Jet, desk jet kind of thing. Yeah, and it just doesn't read right. So sometimes it can be a little funky. Now, if it's a good fake, that can be hard to tell. The first thing I would then look at is like, what's the rating situation on it? Now, people think, oh, if it doesn't have a rating, it's fake. Well, that's not true because there's usually a lot of international stuff that doesn't have the same ratings as us. Uh, so that's not always the tell, but sometimes it just doesn't have any rating on it. The other, or the big kicker, which to, surprisingly, I have not found many of these because I usually tell from the first two reasons, is the disc. The disc usually doesn't have any inscription in the center circle, which usually, I can't remember the coding. There's... So we're talking about the inner circle, yeah, not the outdoor. Um, we don't have a DVD here, do we? No, that's fine, that's fine. So, so think of a DVD, disc, and then there's the center circle. In that little center circle, there's usually, there could be some codes, there could be some wording, there could be some numbering. It's different for every DVD or Blu-ray. Um, I'm kind of butchering this, but usually if, it, if it's a fake, it's like literally just a blank CD has gone through, so it doesn't have any of that inscription on it. And some of the real strong fakes, they're just like this blue, they're like a blue kind of disc. It's not like your standard... I guess you'd kind of call them chromish. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, chromish, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if you've seen it, if, if you go into, go go grab a DVD that hopefully isn't fake, that you've got from a store, 
and you look at it and it's probably got a chromey color and it's really reflective well the fake ones that are hardcore fake. oh it's like it's like the it's like a pearl like like the color of a pearl as opposed to the color of like this blue yeah tint. yeah correct yeah, correct yeah, yeah, yeah. um and that's a certain type of fake i mean you know usually for instance video games same same kind of concept video games burnt video games are usually they're just like a white disc hmm. and it's just got someone's written in text there almost but or you can see that it's been printed over with like a label printer um but the dvds to be honest the fake ones there's not that many of them now because most people have a towel from op shops um and if op shops do have them i usually inform them but honestly i probably find more fakes when i'm buying a big bulk lot of dvds than i do actually out in like the wild cool um there's probably some people that actually i think Uncle Wayno on his YouTube channel, he's got an actual direct video, which we can link down below. I can give you that. Cool. That actually talks about how do you spot a fake because, I mean, he's the DVD king, so, yeah. Awesome. Adequately answered. Next question. Oh, Jeep, it's a big one. I'll take a drink of water. Janelle, keep your questions short. <laughs> oh, was this Janelle? <laughs> this is Janelle's question. Uh, working on your own from home can be a very lonely time. Yeah. Unless you have a lot of motivation and drive, how do you keep your motivation going and not Ooh. procrastinate from and and not and not procrastinate? Jeepers. Um, I mean, there, there's there's so much I could unpack here. Oh, so if you don't know my back this is this is like your whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, <pretty much. laughs> if you don't know my backstory, so I originally um, that's a blur now. So end of 2020, I left my nine to five job with the intention of taking a two year career break, unpaid with the idea to create something that I've always wanted to do, which was my podcast. And I've always wanted to own my own business. Now, going into that unpaid, obviously there was a lot of factors and considerations before doing it. I didn't just, you know, leave and think, you know, how am I going to survive? I did all the math and all that. But I knew if, if I wasn't going to work towards all these dreams, aspirations and goals and f actually try and figure out what those look, those look like, it was never going to happen, right? While working for someone else. So I, I pulled the... um the rug underneath like it just literally went cold turkey but i knew i had to make money in order to survive anyway because i didn't want to rely on savings while building a podcast and i'm like well you know i've done a bit of flipping in the past i used to do that with my mate cameron and um and then got into doing the reselling and binge watch and here we are two years later so how do i stay motivated because two reasons is one purpose and second is money <laughs> sometimes they align um but you know i wanted to find what my purpose was in life now i'm building my my further your lifestyle podcast and that's really my end game and all that branding on it but at the same time ever since i started working full time way back when i was 18 19 i wanted to have my own business but i didn't know what that looked like i didn't know what that meant i tried and failed probably three or four different businesses across 10 years before leaving my full-time job and none of them stuck this one has stuck and I love it. I absolutely love it. So the other thing to now think about is that's good and said because everyone can, you know, I am motivated at the start, but two years in, how do I stay more motivated? Well, it's basically I've got goals that I want and understanding what it is that I want, whether it's you know, buying a house or having this or be able to have a podcast studio or have a warehouse or whatever it may be. I know what my end game is. And the only way to get that end game is figure out what's the gap in between and you've got to do the gap and that's putting in the reps putting in the work learning failing struggling getting help um you know problem solving it's and the best part is i get to design and i guess control that narrative of what it looks like and i also have to be responsible and accountable and content with that because if i don't put in the effort and i don't see results well i can't blame john he had nothing to do with it i gotta blame myself right I, i'm the only one right so you know, we can blame other people, we can blame COVID, we can blame all these things. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to get, find ways to make it work. And that's how I know I'm motivated because here I am, you know, two and a half years since doing that. And, and I'm still having my best months yet. So that motivates me as well, because I'm putting in the work, you get the reward, you do it all again. And every time I have a good week or a best week or a best month, I get super scared. <laughs> Cause it's like, how am I going to do this again the next month? <laughs> But you're motivated to see what you can do. Yep. That's my uh, short answer. <laughs> For me, it's parenting. Being a parent. Mm. Being a parent and being a husband is probably the two biggest motivators. Because 
it's it's like it's the whole um when okay i'll share this i think jenny will be okay with me sharing this so <laughs> when, when jenny and i first Oops. met one of the things that we both fundamentally deferred was i came from a family that said sorry all the time and she came from a family that doesn't say sorry not because they don't they're just proud people but it's because in traditional chinese culture you don't say sorry so we essentially when we had kids we came to a point where we went what do we want our kids to model saying sorry or not saying sorry and we acknowledge that if our kids said sorry easily and meant it then socially they do a lot better than if they were kids who just didn't want to say sorry so okay. so that's what we model and i think with business as well it's i chose to do this business because i grew up with a dad who was a banker and a mom who was an accountant and they would go to work and they'd come home and they'd tell me, I do all this for you. I work really hard. Mummy needs time to, mummy needs time, daddy needs time. And I just went, I'll do it because I'm supposed to. But I never quite understood what they did. Mm. So I chose this business because it's a business that my kids can understand. It's in, And the fact that it's in ho at home actually makes it even yeah. more relatable. So in a sense, for me, there needs to be movement in my business every day so that my kids can see that there's progress. Yeah. Um, they don't understand financial progress. They don't understand fi like business milestones, but they understand new toys coming into the shop and <laughs> they understand parcels leaving the shop. They understand getting picked up at school and seeing a truck full of stock and they understand the next day seeing the truck empty. So hmm. when I go into the house and I say I'm tired, my kids get it. And then my wife gets it, you know. Actually, I had this conversation with a friend who is, is in the waste removal business. So he wanted to get into waste removal and it's like maintenance. It's like, you know, you rock up someone's house and you go, can I take anything away from you? Can I fix anything? That kind of business, right? And essentially he was tossing out whether, the, whether to buy a, a bigger truck or a smaller truck. And I told him the bigger the truck, the better. And he goes, why? I said, because when you bring it back home, because he's got like a yard that he can sort it out so that, you know, he brings the white goods on one day. That way he gets a bit better payout at the tip compared to say the metal another day. So he, I was like, imagine if you bring back this massive truck every single day and your wife goes, wow, every time he brings back the truck, it looks different. That has to say something, right? It's like one person cannot just... As long just, as it's not empty. <laughs> yeah, one person cannot just go and reshuffle the truck you know, for fun. I mean, it's a lot of work. So the fact that the truck comes back full yeah. and it's always different and the sorting piles look bigger, smaller or different, that's progress that one can relate yeah. to. As opposed to if I wanted to be a you know crypto investor and I go and I keep telling my wife, it's going well, it's going well. And I show this screen, it's kind of hard to believe because it's like, <laughs> but I still don't really know what, how this happens. You know what it's I mean? It's always red. Yeah. So, or even if it's green, but like, how does it become green? I don't understand. So my motivation actually is that visual accountability. Um, and that kind of helps me to not procrastinate as well because yeah. um, if I if the kids come home and nothing has moved, it's like, oh, this is strange. Did Dad do any work? You know, not that I need that, but it, it helps me to model that behavior for my family yeah. uh, and help them to understand what running a business looks like. Um, yeah, I think that was. Hmm. How do you keep? How do you motivate yourself? Keep yeah. your drive. And yep. look, just to be frank, like um, there is days where you know. You're lazy. You don't. You don't do what you should do, right? <laughs> I mean, no, 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 never. Like even even this week, like you know, I've been. I mean, here I am. We're we we're, we're doing this. We're not doing listings. We're not doing photos. We're not outsourcing. We're spending time doing this. Therapy. And and you've got to be okay with it because you're not going to be able to do everything that you want every day. As much as you know, get your daily listings up or do this or you know make progress. Yeah, sure. This is making progress. Um, building relationships is making progress. But the difference is you have to be comfortable with what you do. You get to decide when doing this, whether you're full-time, part-time, or doing it as a side hustle, and be comfortable with that, right? But don't don't take, you know, your guilt or shame or frustration of not seeing progress and blame it on other people are saying, I'm not getting any results when you're not doing any work. So it's okay to not do listings one day or don't do something one day because you're tired. <laughs> Right? It's yeah. boring. Or, be real with it. But you also have to use that as a data point. Like if you're doing stuff and you're not enjoying it, why are you not enjoying it? Is it because you don't understand it? Is it a slog? Does it feel like hard work? So then how do you find ways to make it easier? Does someone else need to do that? Maybe you don't like doing listings, but you love doing the photos. How can you do more of one thing and less of the other? Right? And build that into your ecosystem, into your, into your business to make you feel motivated. Right? The beauty is when we do this, we get to make it the way we want. 
So make it easy, right? I'm not saying it will be easy. I'm saying make it easier for you to do. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for These are good questions. Yeah, they are good questions. Good questions. Yeah, so yeah. thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, what is your motivation for having a channel? I'll let you go first because yours, well, yours is younger than mine. Well, you've got a t-shirt with your well, shirt. That's right. Yours, <laughs> yours is younger than mine. So that's um, why you can go first. Motivation to have a channel. It's YouTube. Well, to... To be able to make money so that when my kids are older and when they want to do it themselves, that we can actually have a conversation about it. Because the one thing that I did not get when I was a kid was I wanted to be a cartoonist. I love drawing, love sketching. Um, and I also really enjoy drama. But everybody who was a role model in my life didn't do that. They were professionals, generally in the health and finance and law kind of segments. And they and and they would go, you can't make money doing any of those things. Do what we do instead. And here I am doing what I love now, right? Yeah. I'm essentially, this is a combination of drama, a bit of art, a bit of artistic expression. Turns out I'm quite a creative. So, so then it's like, if we end up here anyways, and I guess most people if they are motivated enough to discover what they want to do in life, they always end up where they were meant to end up yeah, anyways. That's true. Despite the fact that I had 12 years of banking before doing this yeah. reselling thing. And so that's very true. when I look at my responsibility as a parent, my privilege as a parent, um, and not just a parent of my own kids, like a parent in a community of kids, you know, because my kids go to a school, um, parents get to relate to each other. One of the things that, one of the gifts that I want to give to my kid and any other kid who gives me the time of day is if you're a creative and you want to pursue this journey and have some sort of body of work that you can say, if I do this, I could make a living out of it. I want to be that example. So that's kind of my, that's my main motivation for the channel. Uh, so therefore the channel does have to make money. But when I look at the reselling, I'm a six figure reseller as it is, reselling is more motivating than making money on YouTube. So unlike some people who start reselling, use it as a thing for YouTube, and then YouTube becomes their main income. Yeah. I don't ever foresee YouTube being my main source of income. But I do foresee YouTube being enough income to pay for one person's, I guess, full-time salary. So that way, if because that's that, that needs to be the goal. So that if a kid goes, can I support my family or do my share in a joint income household? They can go, Uncle John makes 70000 a year. And that's enough to be a contributing factor. Yeah. So that's my motivation. And to be clear, you're not making any money on YouTube. No, no, hell no, no, no. Okay. But but you can buy me a coffee if you yeah, want yeah. to, and I've never asked for it, it. But I guess it. now is the time. So buy me Do a coffee. It. The link's in the description. Um. So <laughs> there's two answers. This in short, now the answer for the motivation of the channel is to help you further your lifestyle, which is my podcast, which is now on the channel. But my my ch most people probably won't know this. Um, my channel has been around from like 2012, um, and it really took off. When I say really took off, I mean like I really started being active on it. <laughs> was around 2015 and that was for running and my motivation and inspiration for that was I was watching other people on YouTube and GoPro released I think it was the GoPro 4 or 5 and they did like this video where basically it showed that anyone doing anything could document a journey and I remember watching the trailer for the release of that and I got goosebumps Ooh. and I was like because at the time I had just started doing my weight loss journey and I was starting to run so I'm like, you know what, stuff it. I'm going to get a GoPro and I'm going to start documenting my running. Thinking that, you know, it's going to change my life. I'll be like, you know, balling in the dollars and it'll blow up and everyone will like it. <laughs> it. That doesn't work like that. So I remember getting the GoPro, go out for my run and I... I Buy a GoPro, yeah. uh, you get a dose of reality for free. And, and <laughs> what I couldn't work out is why did my footage not look like the trailer? Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> they go for a run and back then they didn't have stabilization in GoPros. Yeah. Um, so I'm running and I think I struck, did the harness here. So I'm running and everything's just like, shoo, like, you know, like no one can see anything. <laughs> and it wasn't even 1080p then. Right. <laughs> and it, it was, it was shocking, but I did it anyway. And then I eventually started just documenting the running progress without talking. Um, and it was pretty boring, but you know, I felt motivated by it. And then eventually I started documenting my first 5k, then doing training plans, 10k, and I progressed from there. And it was predominantly a running channel. Um, and then when I stepped away from the nine to five, I started thinking about, well, I know how to document. I know how to do progress. Like I used to do my marathon and half marathon training plans. I'm like, well, why don't I do this in building the lifestyle that I want to create while at the same time 
creating a podcast called Further Your Lifestyle. Um, and now that's the motivation. So I do this literally to share my journey to help others know that you can do what you want. And I try and document that through, you know, my actions. And that's why I'm very transparent with everything, with the business, sharing my numbers. This is what I'm doing. If you go watch back two years ago, it's cringeworthy stuff. Um, but we all start there. And I don't have anything to hide in that sense. Obviously, there's elements of things that I can't share because that that's my business, how I make my money. But there's plenty there that I can help others do and achieve. And it's not about even the business. It's just about helping people further their lifestyle, chase their dreams, aspirations and goals. So, yeah, that's that's my motivation for the channel. And go listen to the podcast. One of the, I wouldn't say motivations, but benefits of having a channel is that my wife doesn't hear the same thing over and over again. Because um, you, <laughs> it's funny, I talk to you guys on the channel and talk to Chris uh, or any other reseller, right? And then the because we're, with with videos, you have to get to a certain point, you you cover a few things and you, know, you build up this... The Oftentimes, I'll have an issue that I need to discuss with Jenny regarding the business and she doesn't need me to build up that crescendo of that, what, what you see in that video to get to that point. You guys do because you yeah. won't be hearing it for the first time or you haven't heard it three days ago. Yeah. So doing YouTube actually helps me to get that crescendo out of me <laughs> so that by the time I talk to Jenny, I'll be like, so here's what I figured out. And she'll be like, cool. Yeah. And it actually makes sense because she's already heard all that stuff before. Yeah. So and, that's and, <laughs> and, uh, but that's the same for me. Like half the time, like my weekly videos of running, weekly videos of me sharing business updates, other than the sourcing, like, I mean, it's really just me talking to myself anyway. And the stuff I'm sharing to you is the stuff I've only just learnt myself or realised. And it's, it's it's as much as my telling myself than I am to you. So I, I definitely don't get up there and say, I've got this all figured out, do this and it will change your life. It's like, well, no, this is what I've done and it's changed my life or it's yep. working. Therefore, I want to share it with you. And I also do want to address, I do make money from YouTube. And yes, my long-term goal is I want to be able to have YouTube same situation is whether it's replacing an income or an additional income stream at the moment i'm doing on average 150 dollars a month which you know pays for all the giveaways that i do it's it's not like it's making me big bucks but and that's that's revenue right I, uh youtube takes 60 percent. i only get 40 percent of that so you know i just want to make sure that's clear because yeah of course i watch my videos make me more some, some more money and it feels good it motivates me but at the end of the day, I was doing all of this, the runny journey, the podcast and the reselling content way before I started making money because I've only been making money on YouTube for a year. So, yeah. Cool. Your turn. How do you go about finding a tax agent to lodge returns? Oh, Ethan Rushok. <laughs> um, Darren Haycroft, LMP. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, look, I mean, I, I think it's a good thing. So prior to me doing this at a full scale, I had just just a random tax agent, you know, franchise, whatever. And I remember taking them through the process of what I'm doing. And they had so many questions and they didn't understand it. Like they understood it, like from a business perspective, but there were so many things there that I wanted to do right, being a background of project management with numbers. I was like, so how do I solve for this? Or what do I do here? And they couldn't really give me answers that I was comfortable with. And then for me, naturally, I found Ethan Ruchok, which... I highly recommend bias because he is my accountant, but it works. Um, I found him by accident, you know, similar to me doing his own thing. He started his own accounting business. We kind of hit it off and we were chatting. And then I said, Hey, look, you know, I would love for you to be my accountant because I trusted him. He's done reselling himself and yeah, he's, he's been brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But I think you need to find someone that knows what they're doing. That's, that's really what I'm trying to say. So, so you have account, you have accountants and tax agents who will, who like, in the within the box type customers so they where they don't have to solve any problems they're essentially people who take your situation and they categorize it into a computer that's essentially what tax yeah. returns are it's here are a bunch of statements i don't yeah. have time i don't have time to work through all the numbers do it and the accountant goes great this number goes here this number goes here yeah. goes here goes here computer churns out a return that's essentially as basic as it gets um obviously then if someone has multiple entities like you know trust funds or whatever it's once again just this number goes here, this number goes, yeah. here, goes here, goes here, goes here. Eventually, it just trickles down into a machine that calculates a, a consolidated return. If you want an accountant who actually understands what those things mean for you, yeah, that's why you search for a particular agent yeah. for you. Correct. And I think that's that's most people just go. 
I don't want to pay the accountant because I don't see the value. Because yeah, the value <laughs> isn't in the cons you. When, when people say, "Can I launch my own tax returns?" Yes, you can consolidate okay. your numbers into this machine. Yeah. But for me, I'm I'm entrepreneurial and creative. My wife is not either of those two things, and so for we needed an accountant who could explain to her how business works. Because as far as she's, because Jenny for the for a, a couple of years she was just like, you don't contribute anything, and I'm like, I do. She's like, no, you don't. I said, I do. My tax return says I do. She's like, yeah, but the money is not coming. I said, it does. That's that's what it is, and and that's because she's she was someone who goes to work, gets a salary, and but she had this understanding of business that was not quite right, and so now she's great. But having an accountant who is for me, my value was I need an accountant who can play both sides of that, you know, yeah. employed, self-employed. Um, coin to help her understand here's how your finances come together notice how you still have your house you're still paying your bills the kids are still going to school you know all that stuff's still happening and it all still happens because on the numbers you can't just do it on your own if you're doing it on your own you these stuff all these all these no. things don't get held together um helping her understand hey you know he's profitable it's all just in stock at the moment at the, especially in the early stages when you're when you're i remember the first six months we bought 30 grand we sold 30 grand and the whole double garage got filled up and she's just like why are we not seeing any money? He's like, it's because it's all in the garage. Yeah. And she goes, but isn't it meant to move? He's like, yeah, but he hasn't really, he's only he's only building inventory. So in three months time, if his stock starts to turn and the stuff from three months ago is selling out, three months stock yeah. is just standard for retail. Like all that kind of stuff made no sense to her before meeting yeah. the accountant. So there are accountants who will not take yeah. the time of day to explain to you what you need. So in, in Chris's case, very analytical data-driven um, seller. For him, it's like, he doesn't have any relational things his accountants do, but his accountant needed to understand where where his numbers yeah. were going and, and, and provide him with some sort of data crunching prowess. Yeah, but, but it was also because yeah. Ethan's also got his own small business and he's done similar, like he used to sell pop vinyls as a, as a business online. So he's relevant to it and his niche is small business, tax accounting and crypto. So it's like, it's all relevant, right? And plus we hit it off and we're good friends now. So like, you know, he's likable. We, we do chat outside of the accounting world. Um, you know, he's someone that I can chat about other stuff. He does YouTube as well. So, mm. you know, I think, you know, if someone was to ask me, um, you know, this question again, without any of that context that we just said, I've always had the idea in my head that as I build a business, I want to have my go-to guy from accounting. If I, you know, if I have to have a lawyer, I want to have my guy that I go to, right? Building that loyal um, relationship and partnership because... I might not need them every day, but when I do need them, they're the guy that I want to call on or, or girl or whoever, right? Um, and building that portfolio of people or a collective group that we can help each other because it comes back to the whole thing about purpose and, and um, making money is like, he knows what he's doing and I don't know necessarily how I, you know how to do that. So it's like, well, I'll give let him do that. That's his purpose and he gets to make money from it. And because of that, it helps me with my purpose and I save money from that, right? Yep. <laughs> so it, it just makes sense. It just mm. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the uh, next easy question. I'll do the big one this time. Even though it's... I... Many people struggle with postage. Go through how you work out the postage costs for Australia and international. You do international, I'll do... Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, we can jump in. Oh, um, or do you want to go first? Um, Guys... <laughs> Guys, <laughs> it's a heart to heart with John. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. Working out postage to me, the inertia, inertia is that that thing that that pushback you feel right inside is like ugh, that feeling. It's like the feeling you get when you have to practice your lines when you go to when you have to you know write lines when you yeah. do detention or when you have to do suicides for basketball. Like when you have to do something yeah. repetitive. It's the reps. It's nice to know. It, it'll be great if you. It'll be great if you knew if you knew the answer, all the time, but unfortunately, with postage, if you want to be accurate, you weigh everything all the time. If you don't care for accuracy, like I don't, you guys seem to think that I I'm all over the postage. I am, <laughs> but I make money from it because yeah. I estimate to my benefit. Yeah. So. I'll do international postage, right? 500 grams, for the most part, costs, I think, between nine, 19, and 24. Nine, 19 and $24, but can go up to like 32 if you go to like Israel or, you know, some random yeah. Middle Eastern country, okay? I charge $29 flat 
most of my but I also have a band 5 discount which means that it cost me like $9 to ship to New Zealand yeah it cost me like $15 to ship to the States it cost oh, me 19 to go yeah. to to like the to go to UK it cost me they start screaming up to like 25 to go to like Germany yeah. you know Spain, France then it's like 31 to go to the UAE yeah um, but for most of my parcels it sits under that twen- under $20 yeah so I've just picked flat postage $29 not because yeah. that's my way of dealing with the pushback I don't weigh every single item or know how much every item weighs. I just have a rough idea that it's under 500 and yeah. those times it goes over one in every 100 or 200 yeah. parcels. Once again, you'll notice I said 100 and 200. It's a very <laughs> vague thing because in the grand scheme of things, I make money on shipping yeah. already. So when it comes onto it, either you, you, you pick a number that gives you yeah. margin to be loose or if you're the kind that... It's like super pedantic, super mm-hmm. anal. You must get it right because people want to be pedantic and anal for two reasons. Either because that's your nature and you're the kind of person that likes to wear your coffee grind before you pop it into the pop the pedal in the machine. <laughs> I get it. Scientific people, I understand. Or you're someone who's pedantic and anal because you're afraid of loss. No. Okay? If you're afraid of loss, my solution works. If you're afraid that your items, once again, afraid of loss. If you're afraid you're going to lose sales because of that fixed number, test it. Yeah. I sell ten dollar items with twenty nine dollars postage on a regular basis. Yeah, you you have remember, no idea. It's the currency exchange as well, so yeah. usually it's working in their favor. Anyway, but it's not even the currency exchange. I mean, fine, it's a factor, yeah. but it's not a factor because most people don't pay more for shipping than the items worth. Yeah. Generally, and that's yeah, the, I that's know, the but, concern, right? But 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 what I'm saying is, like, a lot of the time, so I'm getting worked up. Yeah. Wasn't no, 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 wasn't no, 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 but like so many times, like <laughs> we th- like you, we're saying that we're scared. Oh, you know, people won't buy it. Yeah. But a lot of the time, we're, our currency is crap, right? <laughs> so, like, a lot of the time, you know, it, we might say 29 but it's only 20 bucks for them anyway. Yeah. So, they, they feel like, oh, it's $9. It's within yeah. the affordability yeah. range so in total. That, yeah, that's what I mean by mm. it because, you know, there's been times where I'll have things sell really quick and I'm like, no one locally would have paid that much in postage, but someone's paid that much and it's like, oh, well, to them, it's, it's 20 bucks. I, I get your point, and that's a valid point. The, the one I was talking about is it's the, it's the how... A lot of people don't sell cheap items on eBay because they feel like if the postage yeah. is more than the item, they, they have, yeah. they feel like because that ratio doesn't make sense, that no one's gonna once again buy it. 134 million buyers on eBay. <laughs> you know, like like it's your way of yeah. doing, your way of your way yeah. of spending money is not the only way. Yeah. So, um, if if it's the fear and fear and fear and fear kind of a, if you're that kind of person, just give yourself margin and yeah. test. Um. And once again, there's so many factors in business that if your product is not a product that people will pay more in shipping than the item's worth, don't carry that same mentality into the next category that you sell in. Yeah. You know, um, I have in baby clothes, most people will only, most people don't want to pay more in shipping than the item's worth. But in collectibles, that rule doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, in collectibles, I will ship a $2 car because that person drove that car and it means something and nostalgia, you know. The elasticity of nostalgia, right? <laughs> like they were paid two dollars for that that Honda Civic in that shade of red because that's what they drove when they were a kid, and then they'll pay twenty dollars so that you can sit on their table and yeah. they'll send me a photo of you going, my table looks complete. Like it's weird, but you. it works. Yeah. So so yeah, that that's so that's my take on postage. Either you measure everything and must yeah. be accurate, in which case if that's your nature and you're scientific and you're one of those coffee grind people, factor the time to make it happen. Yeah. Um, but if you're one of those fear, fear, fear type people, just give yourself yeah. the margin and... And, and uh, so for international, I do calculated, but a lot of my items, it's either books, clothing, yeah. or DVDs that are going, that I sell international, maybe collectibles, and that one I'm really going to measure it. I mean, and way to measure it, but it's pretty much the same thing. Most of them are under um, 500 grams, and it's actually 455 for a lot of places as well. Oh. There yeah, so there's there's some there. Four hundred. If it goes over four fifty five, it triggers over the five hundred gram amount. Um, did, did they drop it recently? I no, no. Was, I, 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 I learned it the hard way because right. I put it and it was like it was like four sixty, and I'm like, why is it twenty five? <laughs> right, and it, the and, same problem. And here's the thing, I'm just showing you that I don't. I'm yeah. not. I I am not. Was it? Well, you've got the factor in the thing, but I'm not the so. fine. What's it? The fine tooth comb. What's that thing they said? Like the. The f- uh, yeah, I, I, that, I don't that know saying like sure. I don't I don't go over stuff with that kind of detail. Yeah. and uh, it, you you don't have to right as long as you've it evens out anyway. Like if you lose some on one, you make it on the other. But for me, I'll answer the. I mean, I do international, but I'll answer for the the standard postage. So 
same principle applies is you've got to have somewhat, somewhat of reps and homework, right? Mm -hmm. And I can walk into a store now and I hope you don't mind if I pick anything up here. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, this, so is a, this, this is a big bulky. If I look at this, maybe not the weight because I don't know how much it is weighs, but this is probably probably five kilos because there's Lego inside. Maybe a bit more, six. Do you want to test it? No, it's fine. <laughs> um, but, you know, I know that it will probably cost me anywhere between 18 and 22 to send this depending on the box. Yep. Um, sometimes more because depending on your cubic or if it's whatever. So this is the one that I'm going to make sure I double check before I send. Whereas something like a, a toy car, for instance, I know that that's going to cost me $9.70. Not including any band. I am on band five, so it's probably only gonna. If it's local, it might only cost me five dollars eighty six, right, or seventy six, or whatever it is. But I know, worst case, this will cost me nine dollars seventy to send it anywhere in Australia, right? So I can look at it. Something that's even smaller than it, right? If it's half the size of it, a book, for instance, that it's gonna be the same price, nine dollars seventy, because I'm gonna put it in a padded mailer. Yep. It's not gonna go into a large box or anything, but um, Australia Post makes it easy for us because we have small medium and large right mm -hmm. and then that's all under five kilos so yep. if you've got a bundle of things you have to weigh it but if it's one big item and it's not necessarily heavy well you know if it doesn't fit in a medium naturally it goes into a large so the worst case it can be is like sixteen dollars and eighty cents or something uh, so what i would encourage you to do is in your niche in your things that you're selling and this is very hard if you're in everything sale a seller, but you'll soon learn, is have an understanding of what's the highest in small, medium, large, and always take that into consideration. Anything less than that, any band savings, well, it's gravy on top. But I know I can probably fit two to three paperbacks in a small padded mailer. I can probably fit more than that in a medium. And then in a large box, well, it's probably going to be even more again. So you need to factor that in, but it's only going to happen over reps, right? Unless you sit down and start measuring everything. If you can't take it off from memory, do what we said and weigh and measure everything before you do it. That's that's the only way to do it or be comfortable with missing one or two here and there because you will, you really will. Um, but that's that's really the way I go about it. Hmm. It's, there's no really, there's no quick win to it other than figuring it's a, it's it out. It's a manual learning process. And for me, when I started reselling, the way, the, the way that I did 30 grand in six months, my first six months, was because I realized that people were not like well, after you bought an item on eBay, there was no no one followed up. The only messages I ever got was leave us feedback. You know, one of those those like you know if if you're happy with your purchase, please consider leaving us feedback. Like piss off, like those ones, right? But then I actually would message every every time someone bought something, I would message them and say, hey, by the way, um, and and you can only do this if you have a niche store because yeah. you know what items are there. If let's say one of these cars, I knew that six of these fit into a small satchel and they were under five kilos. So I'd say, hey, you bought one. Would you like to buy five more? Yeah, because it's the same price. And then, and then they would then, and that's how I would sell. That's how combined shipping became a very big part of my business because I manually messaged everybody. Yeah. And you'd be wondering, isn't that a lot of work? No, just go to Tax Expander. Like you got tax replacement in your in your phones. Yeah. If you type in, you know, um, E N D P. ENDP is not really anything you'll ever use. I put ENDP, it will just spit out, go, let me, know, my descriptions. Yeah, let me know if you want to buy any other items. Da, 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 da. And I saw I would pump in literally 10 alphabets and it would be three different sentences, sent. Yeah. Hi, name, thanks for buying this. One, two, three, sent. And I do it for every single sale. And if you think that's it, that's risky because, you know, oh, what if you go over the over the weight? doesn't matter, you're moving volume. Yeah. So you're, you're yeah, making... Yeah, you'll make it up with the... Yeah. you make it up on the volume side of it anyways. And on top of that, most of you, when you get onto eBay, you look at the you look at the retail for shipping. So you'll go like nine seventy, yeah. and then you'll go fine. I'll charge nine ninety two because I need to make like the feedback. I'm like, no, I charge nine dollars because yeah. I've got the band discount, I've got the volume yeah. from moving combined, and you're still making money. So my math on my items when they're for sale, the math is so easy. It's like nine dollars shipping. It's a flat number. Yeah. And so when people come onto my category and they want to compete with me. First thing they do is they'll match the price and be like, why haven't we, why haven't we sorted by lowest price? <laughs> All right, because that guy is still 99 cents cheaper yeah. shipping wise. Yeah. And then they have to work out whether they have to remove the dollar or not. It's like, they, it's like a whole, like, yeah. it's like a whole mind messing thing yeah. that I do. But you can do that if you understand your numbers, your numbers, but you don't have to understand your numbers to the nth degree. Not that you do, but you know what I mean? Like you're the analytical yeah, out of the yeah, but, but... but but also you have to be careful here is because if you're starting, 
you're not going to be able to have that luxury, right? True. Because you're on... Most of the time, if you just look up Ozpost Band 3 discount, there's usually one flying around the internet somewhere. You get mm. straight onto Band 3. Mm. But, you know, from Band 5, if we send locally... Well, try to find the code. I'll put a code in the description. Yeah, I actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, There's, we'll there's usually always one. Mm. But if you're on Band 5, like $9.70 down to like $5.70, right? If you're local area. Mm. Um, so the other thing you can do there is like, yeah, you could charge $9 and just do Express. You could charge... Because an Express locally might only be... I think the cheapest is like eight eighty six. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? it was like SimCity. Um, yeah. So it gives you options and it gives you power and ability. But again, that only comes after hitting the volume and the reps and doing that. And mm -hmm. so you do have to do your math. That's why I always say if you're trying to send something, you've got to think, okay, worst case, this is nine dollars seventy, even though it's probably only going to cost me eight bucks, right? So it's that's the mentality because if it's cheaper than nine dollars seventy, I'm getting margin. Plus, you do have to take into account that you got to purchase padded mailers and things like that, or bubble yep. wrap, and yep. yeah. So take that into account because usually that's not built into your nine dollars seventy. That's just the cost to send. And then once you once you get used to people paying postage for items, because that's once again a concern. People are not going to pay postage; they will. You can then do your combined postage rules where you know yeah. you add like five percent which every every, every item so yeah. essentially if someone buys one item they pay nine bucks then once they get to like the tenth item it starts to look more like twelve dollars and then yeah. you, you essentially have enough to cover the medium size anyways um yeah so then combined postage ends up being quite straightforward as well um break just just remove a lot of the man all of the manual steps um with margins that you know will yeah. in the big picture be profitable and that's really what business is at the end of the day. You're taking a step back. Because if you think about it, like Kmart, you know, Big W, when they send you an item for free free shipping, they're not always making money. But they understand that the volume moves, the space comes back, they are able to turn yeah. the stock over, make profit again. In the grand scheme of things, it's profitable. That's all that matters. So I think that more or less covers the uh, postage question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Cool. I wasn't expecting us to talk a couple times, by the way. Uh, we're still there. Okay, oh, cool, cool. Good 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 yeah. What is one constant activity that you attribute to your success? Oof. It's the hair. Samson here. Definitely. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh, one, What is one constant activity? So it's an activity. So what, what we're after is, what okay. what do you I'll do? One. I'll go on. Yeah. Routine, 100%. So I'm a routine junkie. Yep. Um, and building a routine that works for you. So like, we're both full-time resellers, but we work complete opposites. He's working at 2 a.m. doing listings, yep. whereas I'm doing him in a completely I have no, job. I have no yeah. routine. But the other thing is, different lifestyles, right? He's got kids and family. I've got Carla and I, I still live at home with my face. You've got Carla and now you don't have Carla for a few months, yeah, so you're like free. So, free but, <laughs> but with that, it gives opportunity, right? So you can flex in that routine. But my YouTube stuff is all routine in terms of what I'm dropping, when I'm dropping it, when I'm doing it. My reselling, I have certain days that I do certain things, whether I'm sourcing, going out, blah da 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 Of course I can flex it, but that routine enables consistency. And as I said in one of the earlier questions is, you you know, you want to make things easier for you. You get you get to control your routine. Well, most of the time, if you're working for yourself, maybe someone else, you know, if you're working for someone else, you don't get to control that time as much because you have to work from nine to five. But take control and build a routine of what you can control, right? So I do my running, I do my YouTube, I do my podcast, I can come out and socialize with John, I do my sourcing. Well, we're not socializing, this is work, man. Yeah, well, we've socialized with, we, we, we eat pies, man. Um, but the point is, is right, I think, I think the consistency of a routine, yep. because if you have a good routine, it enables your ability to do things consistently, which means if it's a healthy routine and it's productive, then you're consistently productive. One activity. I think for me, it's talking, talking about it. Oh, uh, actually, <laughs> it's um, it's like <clears throat> actually telling people what I do. So oh, yeah. Jenny finds this irritating because she hears it all the time. Um, same thing over and over again. Um, but it's like, like we'll go to weddings and then we'll split and people will go, like when most couples stay together and socialize as a couple, we split because essentially I want to go talk to as many people as I can. Not because... Not because I need that socializing, I don't enjoy it, but sorry, sorry, that's, that's, that came out wrong. I do enjoy <laughs> it, but I don't enjoy it the way a social butterfly looks for, like, you know, yay, you know, like, like you know, a kid in a theme park. You would that's never not, guess it, though, would you? You would never but, guess it. <laughs> like, uh, like, Chris saw it first time when we were at the conference, I wasn't nervous or anything, I was like sweaty hands and like I was dripping sweat. Was I'm like, no social butterfly, just to be clear. <laughs> And uh, and uh, I even wore contacts because my glasses kept slipping off my face because it was like I was sweating too much. Um, but yeah, anyways, so, but I talk about it because 
I want feedback. And I want feedback not because I, my ego needs validation. I want feedback because it really helps to put everything I do into perspective. Yeah. And so it's very, it's, it's easy to be, it's easy to build something, fall in love with it, treat it like your baby. And then the moment things don't go your way, you, you, you get disoriented. Yeah, it throws um, you off. It throws you off. And so for me, I like telling people what I do. Uh, I like telling people where I'm headed. Jenny hates this because Jenny will go, like, we'll see the same person, say, in six months to a year, and they'll be like, oh, by the way, has this happened yet? I'll be like, no. And then they'll, and Jenny will go, yeah, yeah, the plan's completely changed. Like, babe, why do you tell people about these plans? Like, these plans are never going to eventually. I'll be like, yeah, because I want to hear the feedback on the plan. Yeah. And so that's kind of, that's that's one thing I attribute to my success. I think, if anything, it's the fact that I just, I'm very, and you guys who watch the channel, you guys know, like, I'll tell you guys everything. And quite frankly, even maybe not everything, but I'll, I'll tell you guys a lot <laughs> and, and, and in a methodical sort of way, because the moment someone goes, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, oh crap, that actually doesn't. And that, that's the feedback. That's yeah. the help. Yeah. And the moment someone says, I, um, like, here's one, right? I found YouTube really, really hard to do because I was nervous, self-conscious, didn't know how to edit. Um, and then when I got to the conference, I thought, I was going to meet up with like Mel Ellis, you know, yourself, or Aussie Flipper was there and just feeling like, oh my gosh, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, how am I going to get to that level? I don't, I don't even have the time. I find it so exhausting doing videos. And then I found out, holy crap, these guys spend hours doing video. And I think like Aussie Flipper does like, he was editing videos from six to eight hours a video. And yeah. I went, I don't do that. I, I record a video and put it up yeah. and I, and my editing time is like 15 minutes yeah. to maybe an hour if I put in the extra bits. This suddenly feels a lot more manageable. That's yeah. the feedback. And so then, as you've realized, since Queen's then coming back, I've put a lot more video because I realized, wait a second, I can do this. But it's that whole shift from my, I don't want to do this, I want to do this, I don't know what, what I'm doing, I feel overwhelmed to like, I can do this, I yeah. have been doing this. And so that, that to me, I think, has unlocked a lot of my capability um, just because feedback leads to I can but it was also like back in end of um, the year last year when we did the Melbourne All Years. All Years? Is that, yeah. When we did the, mm, yeah, the one in Morabi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember when um, Jason introduced you to me because he's saying, you know, he's saying, oh, I do YouTube and you want to know how to do it. And I remember you came and asked, he's like, so how do I start YouTube? And I was like, just do it. <laughs> I was like, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Like, you know, like I'm like, like I, I was confused by the question and I was kind of like, I don't know what he wants me to tell him, but just do it like start like put record your makeup video. on and put your you know hair it was only a couple of weeks hair. later you started doing videos right and but that now tells me that all you needed to hear is like this is what i got to do just do but it you need the feedback yeah. so it's like well just do this you know if you've got a topic just press record and start doing it yeah. and it is really that simple right and a lot of the time with anything we we really just sometimes a lot of us are just seeking that validation or just someone to pull us mm. and then go do it whereas what it's like even with the postage you know, international postage, like how many of us are so scared? Oh, you know, it's, you hear stories, you got scammed and blah, you get scammed, not international anyway. Like that's just normal in life. Mm. But once you go do it, you do the first time, you're like, oh, it wasn't too bad. You do the next time, it's like, oh, yep. it's not that bad, right? So, but I understand that sometimes we just need each other to, and I, I can totally resonate with you saying, you know, people talking to people and mm. how that helps you just move forward. Mm. Yeah. Like going to conferences, meeting bigger sellers, just like, ooh. You know, you came back, you suddenly go, I've got more gas in the tank than I thought. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. it's going to keep going. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Cool. Good one. But two more to go. Oh, gee, this is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> what was... Oh, is it, I oh, think yeah. we've covered this somewhere. Yeah. yeah. What was your life before and how do you describe it today? Wait, what was your life before and how I do you... I guess before just, reselling. Yeah, okay. Benefits and... Yeah. What were you doing before and how did you get into this thing called reselling? Feel free to talk about eBay. Based. Yeah, okay. We covered this already. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in brief, for me, um, worked for a professional services company. Um, I was a project manager. Um, did it for eight years. Took two years leave of absence. But ever since I went through university, I did a Bachelor of IT. I wanted to work for myself. I didn't know what it meant or what that looked like, but I was always trying things. I've had a business where I've sold socks. I've had a business subscription socks. That was, I've had a business where I've sold clothing. I, my first business I ever had was, um, selling Yu-Gi-Oh cards on eBay back when eBay was on dial up. Um, or internet Damn. was on dial up. Damn. Um, my first <laughs> transaction 
it wasn't a business because it was just a transaction was I sold frogs to someone um <laughs> so I've always been like you know trying to hustle or you know sell things on the side so I've always wanted to work for myself but a lot of the time we don't know what that looks like I, I used to buy and sell computers I used to build computers and sell them mm -hmm. um and nothing really stuck but working th going through project management and doing that working for someone else I thought I was going to be there a lifer but I also thought well I'll do it to a means to an end I'll get a lot of money I'll build the lifestyle I want from that money and everything will just figure itself out but I realized that after doing 60 hour weeks during COVID because I had nothing else to do that I've got all these dreams and aspirations but I'm like spending one hour a week on any of that and usually when I have that one hour, I'm too tired to do anything anyway. So I'm like, mm. at this rate, I'm never going to see it. So yep. I really kind of just had the conviction of it's either I get fired and I figure out how to survive or I have to rip the bandit off and do it myself because there's no way they're going to fire me if I'm doing this good for them, right? I'm working six hour weeks, not because, you know, I was bad at my job. It was because there was so much work and we're getting it done and moving forward. Um, but I realized, well... If I don't try, I won't know. Wait it up and yeah, two years later. Mm. Yeah. And just to be clear, I'm making 60% less than what I was, probably even 80% less than what I was doing working for a corporate gig um, than I am now. But I also know that there's no ceiling for this and I'm willing to ride this out for a minimum of seven years first before I even start calling baselines and comparing because I was working full-time for seven years before I took the leave of absence, like full-time. And that's the only compare that I have of where I can build my career doing this in seven years. So, um, yeah, I think that benefits and pros and cons of doing that, doing this, well, obviously there's comfort and we've got, you know, confidence of knowing that you had a paycheck coming in. This is scary as heck, but I am not stressed. I, I more mindsets, more healthy than ever. Don't have to worry about what other people are saying. I just get to do myself, but also it means what I put in is what I get out. So, Mm. Yeah, that's, I mean, we could probably talk. I mean, I have a podcast on this kind of stuff. <laughs> so. Photo your lifestyle podcast. Yeah. Um, the, I've always been flipping things. You just reminded me, I used to buy blackberries and then buy the, <laughs> you know, the, the different colored cases and then swap out the old cases oh, yeah. with the yeah, different, yeah. so I had to be selling like a you know, neon green uh, and you blackberries. And Nokia's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just reminded me, I used to do that. Back in forgot. the day. Back in the um, day. So I was doing for, uh, the, whenever I was, I used to work in a bank and the thing that would rub managers the wrong way, the ones who were very by the book micromanagey types was the fact that I would try and do things better, faster. And it was things like even, you know, I have a Bluetooth headset on and I'd be taking phone calls and then they, they were the types who would be like, don't use your phone to call customers, use the work phone. Like those managers used to get pissed off with me because I'm like, yeah, but I can get it done faster. You know, I don't have to. I can walk around and get stuff. Anyways, the point being is, um, when you you eventually realize if you enjoy running a business that you spot patterns, you're a pattern spotter. That's what business is. Um, you see trends in items, you see trends in operations, you see trends. And the biggest frustration you feel when you work a job is that you can't fix any of those things. You'll see them in work. You'll see you'll see walking bad pat you'll see walking bad patterns everywhere, and you cannot do a single thing about it, and that will piss you off, and you'll be like, and you start my own gig. But then you start your own gig and you realize, oh my gosh, I need to actually structure, I need to structure my day. My gosh, I suck at managing myself. You know what I mean? So um, surround yourself with a team. You need to be accountable with somebody. Uh, seek resources like these channels. Um, but yeah, so so for me, life before structured paycheck, but very frustrating, very exhausting. Um, Jenny will say that whenever we went on a date, I pick her up after work and I have an hour nap before going out anywhere. Uh, but now I don't sleep as much, but I am happy I work a lot more. And once again, work in the sense that it's kind of play for me because I'm yeah. very much a big kid. So the 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 fact that I get to play with toys because I like toys and I get to sell them for a living and do it with my kids. You know, that's, that's re reselling to me. It's not so much about the flipping. It's about the fact that there's a platform called eBay. that allows you to sell anything that is legal and safe and within reason. Um, <laughs> Boundaries. And there, there are there are exceptions, but it's a very small 
list of exceptions compared to everything yeah, else. And good, actually. the fact that there's a platform that allows me to take any item and sell it, um, in the fact that 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 is possible means that I can create a business out of any thing. And I think the, the the reason why reselling is intimidating for a lot of people is because it's anything. You don't know where to start. Yeah. And then you don't and then there's no no one can tell you what you should sell because once again, you're essentially you're essentially asking someone you're asking me, I sell some things out of the anything. He sells some things out of the anything. We will tell even if we told you exactly what we sold, you may not appreciate what we sell. I love toys because I'm a big kid. Yeah. I don't sell clothing. Yeah. He appreciates clothing. Yeah. You know, like, so So in that sense, when people say start with what you love, it seems cliche, but that's that's really well, it's true. A, it's the quickest win. Quickest win. Like you, because you appreciate it, you understand the category, you... You don't have to do any work. It's yeah, like you, it's just, just, you just pick it and you go, hey. Yeah. You know, so... Um, and you know what to do with it. Like, for example, like I remember when I showed someone my, my photos of action figures and um, I, was, I was using the... I was giving people like the root finger with the with the fig, with the the figurines. Right. I was doing that. And they were like, dude, that's... I would never think to do that. I'm like, yeah, I do because I'm a big kid. I'm cheeky by nature. <laughs> I understand how to get attention because I'm a big kid, once again. Yeah. And therefore, if I picked men's clothing, none of that comes out. Yeah. But if I probably pick, model it. Yeah, but if I picked... Actually, actually, someone mentioned this. Like you said, if I was a clothing seller, I'd be that kind of... There's, there are people on eBay who who um they, all they, they have chest photos so there's like there's like a, a like a lady in a bikini with like i think really big breasts and then there's like a hammer sitting in between the cleavage and then that's the photo and essentially that's the cheeky I'm, right i've never seen i've this, seen, I've anyway. seen it, it happens in the states i'll try and find something are you sure this is still ebay no no it is, it is. <laughs> and essentially the the item for sale will be the hammer oh. or the item for sale will be like the harmonica that's like sandwiched in between oh, the cleavage gosh. but that, but that you know what i'm trying to say so there will I digress, but not really, because Marketing. there is a there is an item that brings out the best of you that allows you to differentiate your item from the rest of the items on eBay. Because anybody can get this item to sell it. Yeah. But not everybody will know how to sell it in a way that is attention seeking, that brings out its best value, its best features. Like to some of you, this is a rusty looking robot. To me, there are photos I can take of this that will bring out the shine of the helmet. You know what I mean? So so <laughs> You're giggling because like it's it's. I'm, I'm like, having too much fun with this. Like what what? Like, yeah. Why? Yeah. But I get so, it. I understand. I understand. So so so, <laughs> so reselling is very much my artistic release. It's also uh, it's it's also a free for all. So essentially, if you want a pure learn how to run a business oh, yeah. avenue, this is it. It's like, I mean, you could go buy a franchise, but you'd still. If you see a bad pattern in that franchise, good luck trying to fix that yeah. pattern. You and know? That, that's like jumping into the deep end. Hmm. This you can build at your own pace. And I understand that a lot of people are doing this as a side income or a side hustle. And I, I said this to John earlier. It was like, you know, I'm jealous of people that have a full-time income that enjoy that and are able to do reselling and earn an extra $200, $300, $500 a week or a month because that's practically can be anywhere between a 2 to 10% pay rise, hmm. right? We don't have that luxury of a nice little 10% pay rise on the side. Everything that we're selling is literally making the average pay is probably five grand a month, right? Mm. To just get by. And if that, depending on how the month is and the trends and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not easy, but we, we change it up for this because we like the lifestyle. We it's like the fit. The fit's it, the biggest it, appeal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, you know, now I, you know, I would never have imagined that I was selling clothing. I would never imagine I was. Like, I think while I was just sitting here, I just sold a, a Cisco phone that I found in my last week's video from an op shop, paid $20 for it. it. It just sold for $98, right? I know nothing about it, but I saw it and I'm like, I had sold previous like work business phones before just simply because I got them from, I think it was hard rubbish or somewhere and I tested them out and tried it. So now whenever I go out, if I see another one, it's like, oh, okay. But you know. I mean, those, those are ones like hold the line like yeah like the, the Cisco ones buttons, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and you would like you don't think about those things and like I used to have them at work when I was working full time but again I would never have thought the value of them for a small business I don't use it for my small business mm. but if you're working with five people that are you know small office at home or something it makes sense and brand new they're probably three hundred four hundred dollars mm. so you know in that it's like I only learned that from going through the experience of learning it right and I acquired that knowledge and now I can repeat it. You know, 
I've just told you all that, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I found I f I found working in a job didn't teach me as much about life and managing myself yeah. and yeah, my that's, skills that's, than that's very true. being in business too. So through becoming a reseller, I've parallels. Whenever I find myself talking to younger people or anyone wanting to take a leap of any sort career wise. I find that I can, I can, I can talk to them. I can give them advice. I can actually yeah. provide insight because we touch so many aspects when we do this for yeah. a living. Um, and the other thing is beyond the money, like we've made money, we've been able to make an income, full-time income, but it's also been to create jobs. I've given work to four people in four years. Yeah. So in that sense, and I've got my first hire. As there well. you go. Yeah. So, so in that sense, it's, um, yeah, although this is opportu more opportunity, bigger fit, Better fit, more joy. That's it, really. Yeah. Last, Last one. one. <laughs> do you, was it? Do you have structure or <laughs> schedule, schedule daily? Day. Yeah, we've covered this. Yeah. Um, my 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 schedule essentially revolves around my kids. So Jenny goes to work, kids go to school. I drop them off. I come back. I work. Do whatever. When I say do whatever, I just get work done. And then go pick up the kids if I need to. Send them for extracurricular. Yeah. Come back. They go to bed. I work at night. That's my. Yeah. They essentially are my fixed. Mine, mine's off like a, a bit of a tier system in the sense of I've always had, as, as I said earlier, I'm a routine junkie. So I've always had certain days of certain things. So like if I take it up a level outside of business, it's like Tuesday nights, family night, we have night shows, for instance. Monday night, you know, is when we do certain something else or Friday, whatever kind of thing. So there's that layering of just life in general. But then I have routine for when I'm releasing YouTube videos and I then work around that knowing that, okay, Mondays, this is what I have to do. But then I have my post days. So... Those are the certain days that I'm posting. Hmm. Um, and then I have to adjust that routine as things change. But yeah, oh yeah, everything is routine based. And I know that Friday is usually Friday is usually the day I go out with Carla and we hang out and do stuff. But Carla's not around. So I've been using it to catch up with friends, go out and do other things or play catch up or get ahead or, you know, do what I want to do. Hmm. Weekends, I try and not do as much work. But if I don't have anything planned, I just work. I mean, hmm. what else am I going to do? But Again, different lifestyles and things like that. But yeah, 100% routine schedule. I mean, if people want to know in detail, I'm more than happy to share. I've talked about it on my channel a bit, but I, I, it really just comes back to you have to have something there that makes it easy to fall back into because, you know, otherwise it's very hard to move forward because if you don't know what needs to happen or what you need to do, it just becomes overwhelming. But if you know, it's like, okay, well, these are the days I'm going to do all my photos or these are the days that I'm going to do all my listings or I'm going to do my listings at this time. And it just gives you that routine to be able to say, okay, well, that's what I've said. That's what I'll do. And now you know what you've got to do. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, let us know in the comments, subscribe to both our channels, share with a friend and we'll do this again. Yeah. Second time went well. Next time we'll, we'll, we'll do it with Jason as well. And Jason, Jason has a very swanky recording studio, so we would love to use that instead of this. Please. But we will bring the basketball with us because that needs to feature everywhere we go. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, any any questions that you want to ask, I mean, we'll we, we, did, we did ask for questions and questions did come, but I suppose more would have been good too. So. Well, I mean, we did pretty good. We've been, what, we've been but, doing this for an hour and, and a bit, 15 minutes, so. Okay. Um, yeah. Ask more questions in the comments so that we can use it for the next one. Yeah. Until next one, take care. Happy reselling. Cheers. Bye. Good stuff, man. Well done. Can't shake the feeling like we didn't record. But we are recording. It's the pause. All right, cool. Next one, you'll be like, if you didn't, if this is not recording, <laughs> I will kill you. I quit. Does this make my thighs look big? No. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. It's so, it's so, it's so strange. Like, you... you, you... <laughs> You want to start again? This is so awkward. Is it re already recording? It is recording. Yeah, okay. You think? Yeah, it is. It is. Well, it was the same time when we did it with Jason, right?